morning. Now today's webinar will look at issue identification, problematizing and research question framing. With this, generally we hope that the webinar will help you to develop an understanding about the potential conflict between the outcome expectations, the research problem and the research questions. Um, specifically, we hope that you will learn how to identify and articulate workplace-based issues to practice how to problematize and articulate research problems and to derive corresponding research questions and ensure these are actionable. And to learn about the existence of guides and guidance. Now, with this, why is this webinar of relevance? Basically, it will help you to focus your work because issue identification, problematizing, and question framing are essential skills that you need to develop through your doctorate. And it is something that is to be gradually trained and not a one-off action. Now, let's go into the first part, how to identify and articulate workplace-based issues. Perhaps, what is an issue? It is something problematic and unlike a problem, it is not really well understood. So, for example, if you look into this, AI experts say automation could replace 40% of jobs in 15 years. This is something that might be an issue. It has something that shows a certain type of problematic because if you lose your job, then this certainly will have impacts. But it is not a real problem at this point in time. So uh, there is a potential for an issue, but at this point in time, it is still not realized. This is something very important, that issues are real. They are not fictive. Let's look into this case. Um, last year, a strange self-driving car was released onto the quiet roads of Montone. Monmouth County, New Jersey. It was unlike anything demonstrated by Google, Tesla, or General Motors. The car didn't follow a single instruction provided by an engineer or programmer. Instead, it relied entirely on an algorithm that had taught itself to drive by watching a human do it. Now, this is perhaps scary and worrisome, but in the current form, it's not a real issue. Um, it's only hypothetically problematic. Now, on the other hand, this situation, the crashed car, is a real and existing situation. It is something that can, can be sensed or observed, so we can be looking into it and analyzing it. So this is clearly an issue, and over that issue that we can observe and sense, we can further go down and try to understand what are the exact problems so do we really need to wait until the crash to happen? No, um, this is not required. We can anticipate and foresight and work over related areas that we can perhaps identify. If you look onto the right image, you will see the patterns and trends. Now, it's unlikely that something like this has never happened before. And therefore, we can look into related areas. For example, in this case, the Tesla might have crashed because it was a software issue or it had a malfunction on the sensors. Now, it's not the first time that there will have been software issues or malfunctioning of sensors. And therefore, we can look into related fields and work over existing rules, root causes that are well known and understood in such related fields. And this might help us to anticipate what could happen in new cases that never have been dealt with, like this um, self-driving car. Is this making sense to everyone so far? Are you with me? Okay, let's go into the next. The Internet of Things is something that's very much talked about for quite some years already, and it's a very complex, and blurry field. I mean, everything potentially could become part of the Internet of Things. We see more and more sensors. 
um, arising, for example. Once I did my shopping at Decathlon, which is a major sports store um, in Europe, you now just need to put your basket um, into, into the cashier area and immediately it counts every product that's in there because all of them are outfitted with some sort of ships. So this is part of the Internet of Things. It's, it's something very big and surely um, if you're not prepared as a business like uh, this example of Decathlon, then that might be very problematic for you in the midterm because you will uh, lose out in terms of competition. So now let's look into this report. Um, everybody is talking about the Internet of Things, a buzzword supposed to magically solve all challenges inherent in digital transformation. With such projections, company leaders feel the urge to invest in IoT, but are often held back by lack of accurate and credible calculations for the expected return on potential initiatives. Now, are there any issues in here? The authors of that report mention a number of things, such as unsurprisingly failure rates of digital transformation initiatives lie in the range of. So there's a lot of things that's described as if it would be an issue. But if we break it down and look into that, then the four statements that we saw in the last slides are challenges inherent to digital to transformation. Well, that's not an issue, but it's the authors say it's a challenge. And as I presented it, a quite generic one. Now, lack of accurate and credible calculations for the expected return on potential initiatives. It's not an issue, but this is a clear problem. So there's something that can be looked into. Likewise, start initiatives or projects without a proper business case at hand. Well, it's not an issue, but an informed decision. So it in itself might be a problematic decision that you have taken. And finally, failure rates of digital transformation initiatives lie in the range of 60 to 85%. So that's not an issue, but a conclusion based on evidence. So what I want to show in this case is you're looking in a blurred and very complex situation like the Internet of Things, and you read some reports that look into the for or forecast the situation there, and that seem to be very troublesome and very, very complex and blurred. Now, if you, if you analyze the different parts of the report, you will understand that at the end of the day, all of the statements will look that simple as these four examples that I picked up from the research report that we looked into. So it's something, if broken down, loses the complexity and therefore can be very good and easily addressed. So um, this is a way on how to deal with issues or how to move from unclear and big complex nebulous issues into more small problems that can be well understood and looked at. With this, we come into the second part of our webinar. Are there any uh, questions still for the first part? No? All right. So how to problematize and articulate research problems? Perhaps we want to look into what constitutes a research problem in the first place. I've been finding this article on developing a dissertation research problem, um, which provides a guide for students and in there, I found this statement. Um, and from that statement, one can understand that there is an apparent difficulty in articulating problems. So it's, it's something that is not only, it didn't only happen to me once I made my way through the doctorate, and it's not only happening to most of the students with whom I'm working together, but apparently it's something that's more generally happening. And now, if you look into this statement a bit deeper, then one also can see one of the key reasons why it is for a doctorate student certainly difficult, or for anyone who's new to any scientific field, to come up with the problem statement. The reason is you do not, need, you do not know the scholarly literature in detail, and this therefore will pose a very challenge in itself to your ability to articulate the research problem. No. If you look into this article, uh, you also find this statement saying that constructing 
problem statements is usually a formative process. That is, the first drafts rarely are acceptable, but they serve an important function in helping to progressively sharpen the logic and you'll illuminate the various options. Now, what this means is that problem framing is an itinerary process, it's gradual, it's not a one-time option, uh, action, and it is also something that will emerge and develop as your literature knowledge equally will emerge and develop. Is that making sense? So it's something that you need to understand you will be doing gradually over and over. And the first research questions are really just a rough guidance for you. And as you progress, so will the question emerge. Now, are there any guidances on the research problem? So yeah, issues with problem statements that usually can be seen, there is that a problem statement fails to establish the existence of the problem, or it explains every problem in the same way. It might neglect to show any history to the problem, it lacks support to show what is related to it, or it has limited meaning outside of the personal experience, or it has a too high level of abstraction. Having said that, you also can have the opposite. It is too detailed and narrowed, so it must have the right fit, and it should be of importance to the field of study. Now, those are quite some um, general guidance, but how do I come from this general guidance into framing a problem. Is there any guidance available to support me in this? Well, I've been looking a bit around um, and found actually two very concrete and good tools or guidances um, that can help you. So let's look into this first one, which is called what's the problem represented to be approach. Now this is actually a quite nice approach on how to come to the problem because if you look at it, the VPR approach is a resource or tool intended to facilitate critical interrogation of public policy. So it was made for the public policies case, but I think it's equally applicable to other fields. It starts from the premise that what one proposes to do about something reveals what one thinks is problematic and therefore needs to change. So this is to say that if you look into dialogue, for example, um, the forms of training are recommended to improve women's status and promotion opportunities. The implication in this is that what is implicitly seen as a problem is a lack of training opportunities. So you come from the recommendations that are provided by others into the lack of training, which seems to be the underlying root to the problem. So it's, it's a very simple mean to see where could problems reside. However, this would be an approach that needs dialogue, which means you would need to engage with those stakeholders um, that see this issue of uh, improving women's status as being problematic at, the, at this point in time. Now, it's a very um, informative book that Carol Petrie was writing, and I recommend anyone taking a look into it. And it also covers the common problem and its partner, the solution. Now we, we are running a number of webinars dedicated to the solution bias and the issues that the solution focus can cause. And in accordance to Carol, in an area when a problem solving motive is near hegemonic, think here of evidence-based policy and contemporary Western eagerness to produce students as problem solvers. The VPR approach serves as a much needed interruption to the presumption that problems are fixed and uncontroversial starting points for policy development. It reminds us that the banal and vague notion of the problem and its partners, the solution, are heavily laden with meaning. I think what's very interesting here is that is a statement of problems are fixed and uncontroversial, which um, definitely is not the case, and certainly not if you deal with problems that involve humans and that are potentially wicked. So I think anything that involves humans needs to be taken with care and 
this con uncontroversial starting point and what is controversial in it needs to be worked out carefully. Now, let me go further. If we just focus on this part of her statement, you also could ask the other way around, to what problem is this the solution? I think this is a very mighty question that you likely should ask yourself um, within your research, but also within the communication with others, because it can help you to do away with this solution focus and to really move the point of view and change it into the problem direction. So to what problem is this actually a solution? I mean, this is a very reflective question that one could ask. Now, are there any further tips on how to frame a problem? Yes, um, I think there's a very good one. And actually, a research colleague introduced me to this um, three years ago. Um, it's something from the 17th century, and it's called the apt approach. And the apt approach is an alternative to the AAA approach, which is an approach that students in particular at the early stages of their research like to adopt. And, and, and means uh, just descriptively telling what they read in the literature, which is something that is easily to be done and uh, not as demanding as critical analytics. However, if you adopt the apt, then you start with the end, you bring in the but, which is a contradiction, and then you come with the therefore, which is an analytical conclusion. Now, in this case, um, noted here, a, we know it's the apt is the spine of the hero's journey, which Folklight describes as the handbook of life. The hero lives in a world of peace and contentment, but then a problem arises. Therefore, the hero sets out on a journey to solve the problem. Now, in this case, what would be the focus of the research is not to solve the problem, but sets out on a journey, which means looking into this problem. So, in the simplest form, one could say that problematizing is about the therefore. So, this is a simple tool. Again, it's an end, but therefore that can help you to build up a logical sequence on how to problematize an issue. If there's no therefore, there's no issue. If there are only ends, there's no issue. So if you want to train on how to problematize, um, apt is a very simple but effective tool on doing this. And um, I also provided in the below sources to uh, further readings where you can study how to do that more in detail. Now, in the third part, how do we derive research questions and how do we assure that these are actionable? So, what is the question to the problem? And what is a good research question to ask? We have recorded a dedicated webinar on this, on how to formulate research questions. So I'm not going into detail into this. However, as a terms of advice, research questions must be focused, specific, complex, sufficiently complex, analytical and unbiased, or at least you need to know and be aware about potential biases. Again, oops. Uh, They should be focused on the problem and not on the solution. This is a very simple example that shows on how the research question can entirely develop differently in dependence on how it is framed. In this case, um, let's look at the problem statement. Students living in dorms A, B, C, and D, and these dorms currently do not have air conditioning. And during hot seasons, it therefore is very inconvenient for students to work in the storms. Now, there are two questions we could be asking, a solution-focused question or a problem-focused question. The so solution-focused question would be, how can we make the dorms more hospitable? Now, this is a question that invites us for speculation. 
And if we go down the research lane, uh, the research outcome will be equally speculative. Um, it might be something, I've been making up this case, along like, we hope to have found a solution, but might end up understanding that monetary reasons have not been the real issue, and that thus far no air conditionings have been installed in dorms A, B, C, and D. So ultimately, we don't really know if this either is the case, since we might as well just have forgotten to look into some funding options that we did not hear about. So if we ask a speculative question, um, it's clear the entire research will be equally speculative. On the other hand, if we ask a problem-focused question, it's clear that the question will be guiding us down the analytics up to the root of the problem. So as a problem-focused question in this case are, why are there no air conditionings in dorms A, B, C, and D? To which the research outcome well could be, based on the research result of the study, we will understand the reason why thus far no air conditionings have been installed in dorms A, B, C, and D, and what potentially could be done to resolve the situation or mitigate the problem because perhaps there's not enough funding at hand. So if we ask a problem-focused question, then we certainly will also get down the research much more focused on the problem and that allows us to identify the roots. Now then, why is it so hard to craft research questions? Um, initially, I already mentioned uh, that hopefully after this webinar, you will understand the relationship in between the problem statement, the research question, and the outcome expectation, and the bias in there. The, issue, the point here is, um, there's a clear bias or a tendency towards framing the question in the direction of the outcome expectation, which is what you want to get out of the research and what is the motivation of doing this. And this is also clearly understandable why is this is the case, because at the start of the research, you have a much clearer understanding about what you want to take out of it. Uh, yeah. What is it, the situation as you would like it to be? And therefore, it's much more obvious and much uh, simpler to ask the question that is matching to the outcome expectation. While the problem still is very much unknown to you, therefore, it is very tricky to come up with a problem-focused question. So, but as said in the second part of this webinar, this is something that gradually needs and can be worked out. So then, what is an actual novel question? Now, in the very simplest way, it's a question that allows you to act upon it. A research question should be actionable, elsewise um, it's very hard to operationalize it. And if you want to operationalize it, you should explore, the question should explore something along the who, what, where, how, and why. Now, as earlier said, we have a dedicated webinar uh, recorded. You might want to take a look into the right type of question framing in dependence on what you want to explore. But as we have seen with the example of the solution versus the problem-focused question, good questions do matter. Much of an executive's workday is spent asking others for information, requesting status updates from a team leader, for example, or requesting a counterpart in a tense negotiation. Yet, unlike professionals such as litigators, journalists, and doctors, who are taught how to ask questions as an essential part of their training, few executives think of questioning as a skill that can be honed, or consider how their own answer to questions could make conversations more productive. That's a missed opportunity. Questioning is a uniquely powerful tool for unlocking value in organization. It spurs learning and the exchange of ideas. It fuels innovation and performance improvement. It builds rapport and trust among team members, and it can mitigate business risk by uncovering unforeseen pitfalls and hazards. Now, many of the students with whom I'm working, they are coming from the business field, and very much indeed, they are very quick in drafting their research survey and starting the research and going out and just trying to get things done. Um, taking time and crafting questions is something that is not that common. Now, is, if this quote that is shown here is correct, 
then perhaps there's a good reason to reconsider being too hasty and quickly in being active, but rather spend some time and learn how to frame questions. Now, this also can support us in decision making. Let's look into this example. During the 60s, Big Blue had the opportunity to buy or license Xerox new reprographic photo process. IBM hired a consulting firm to answer the following question. If a more reliable, cheaper and faster processing firm were available, how many more copies from the originals would people make in a given year? However, important that inquiry may have been, IBM asked the wrong question. I might. According to Paul Schoemaker, and Stephen Krupp's article in the MIT Sloan Management Review. IBM ignored a new segment of the market that turned out to be many times larger, namely copies of copies of copies. This was a huge overlooked opportunity. What if IBM had asked instead? How might the new Xerox process change when and how people make copies? And what might this grow to in total number of copies made in future years? Now, this again shows that question framing is a crucial skill and that it is well worth spending time on training that. But as we said initially, it's a gradual process um, that is emergent. And as much as the literature knowledge uh, with you will mature and as much as the problem understanding will mature, as much the ability will mature to ask the question and as much as you collect data and analyze data, as much you will understand what the question is answering or the other way around, uh, how well is the question answer what your data is showing you. So this is something that needs to be gradually built up and the question answer match need to be seen. Now, asking the right questions is like any other form of creation. You have to start somewhere, then form it into shape over time. What I meant by this was that sometimes you have to start with something rough and unpolished to get an initial response to at least do something then over time with feedback, form it into what it needs to become to get you the results you're looking for. Formulating a magnificent question is just like building a product feature or system in a business. It takes iteration to get it right, where it needs to be once there, the desired impact can be delivered. Now, I think it is very important to understand and to give us the time in our research to go from the initial unpolished and ugly version into the final and nicely polished uh, version that will be submitted um, for examination. So this is something that you might want to take always into account and always take stock about it. So to understand where are you in your research and how do things add up. And mirroring, which uh, we also have a webinar dedicated to, is a good approach to learn how to do that and to keep a record and overview. Now, let's come into the final part of this webinar and quickly reflect on guides and guidance and also to understand why guides can be false friends. Now, first and foremost, guides are written by those that know about it. Um, you could call them the old foxes, experienced scientists, people that really have learned the ropes and they have a clear understanding how research and the scientific process works. However, this also means um, they will have lost the feeling of the problems that research students at the time once they uh, start doing research um, have. They will read all of the literature with very different lenses than you as a research student will be doing. So this is to say that they will know about what is a problem while you perhaps are still not. So if they, if they write things in this way, it is making sense in a way it's articulated um, from an expert perspective, but not from a research student's perspective. And time 
is here exactly one of the main differentiators because they will have had a lot of time already through the scientific, the research process, they will understand things very differently than you at this point in time. There are many things that you simply do not know. Therefore, guidance is a tricky thing um, and perhaps it's always important to connect with peers, so to uh, look at and evaluate the perception of such guidance amongst peers, so to assure that you just pick up and adopt the right lens that was meant for this guide or guidance. Now, frequently, um, things that could be false friends are examples like this. Uh, researchers should begin by identifying a broader subject of interest that lends itself to investigation. Now, this does not mean to start broad. One still is expected to start from a specific issue, like a clearly articulated workplace-based problem. What this advice means is that subsequently the specific issue has to be placed into the broader subject of interest. Yeah, this is a very different thing. And interest in this regard should direct you to ask what are we interested in resolving and not focusing on the resolving. Now another example for a false friend could be this tip. Begin to narrow the topic by asking open-ended how and why questions. For example, a researcher may want to consider the factors that contribute to childhood obesity or the success rate of intervention programs. So understand the guidance is not suggesting that you focus on the status rate of intervention programs. What the guidance suggests instead is that you focus on the factors that are contributing to. Thus, your research investigates factors that are contributing to whatever, but not the success rate of intervention programs. So I think those two examples might bring it out what, why guides could be false friends and why it is important to understand uh, which lens to wear and have. Now, if you want to study further on how to identify issues, problematize and frame research questions, we do have an advanced online training course um, available for this and as by the second half of this year, we will make all of our advanced online courses uh, available for free self-studying. So please watch out. At one point, uh, this feature will become available to you, and then you are very much welcome to train this further. With this, we thank you for attending today's webinar, and 